Welcome to Really This Week in History. I'm your host, Daniel Price. For anyone who has ever thought, man, we are living through history, this podcast is designed to prove you right. Weekly, a guest and I will discuss a current event, its historical context, and how it may be viewed by future historians. recorded, edited, and published this podcast using the free Anchor app. It combines all the tools you need to create your own podcast with little to no experience of your own. Not only does it allow you to record right in the app, it also helps you distribute your podcast to Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and many more services. You can even make money from your podcast with sponsored ads with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. In the November elections, Oregonians voted to decriminalize hard drugs, sending shockwaves across the drug policy world. That law went into effect Monday. Instead of prison sentences, users will be steered toward education and rehabilitation. With me to discuss this story and its place in history is Dr. David Courtright, Presidential Professor Emeritus at the University of North Florida and author of The Age of Addiction, How Bad Habits Became Big Business. Dr. Courtright, Compared to federal and other state and local laws, both now and historically, just how wild and crazy is this Oregon law? More or less, how does it compare and how did we get here? Well, I think it's the culmination of the latest cycle of drug policy liberalization. I think that the the way to think about drug policy in American history is that it's gone through a series of cycles. Uh, It really gels in the early 20th century when you get the development of things like prescription laws and uh, bans on opium smoking or the importation of opium smoking. Uh, And then ultimately, of course, we have the prohibition not only of certain drugs like heroin, but for a time the prohibition of alcohol. So there's this, this, this progressive reaction against unregulated drug and alcohol markets uh, there's a reaction against that in the in the 60s, actually the late 50s and the 60s, where people say, wait a minute, you know, we've got a black market. People are overdosing with adulterated drugs. Uh, we've got people rotting in prison for years. Let's do something else. Let's try decriminalization. Let's try methadone maintenance and so on. Uh, but by the late 70s, 80s, and early 90s, very different situation. You've got people who want to restigmatize drug use, uh, step up enforcement. Uh, they're opposed to maintenance. They are in favor of abstinence-oriented treatment, and uh, very much in favor of things like mandatory minimum sentences. Which brings us to the recent past, where you've got a reaction against that. Um, if you think about it, since the mid 1990s, with the beginning of um, the legalization of medical marijuana, there's been a sort of long reaction against the perceived excesses of the drug war, Uh, harm reduction measures, needle and syringe programs, uh, medically assisted recovery, things of that nature. And then, of course, most recently, taxed recreational cannabis sales, which are now available in, I believe, 11 states, and you've got medical marijuana in 35, and then the Oregon measure is uh, the cherry on top of the of the latest uh, cake, so to speak. It's, uh, it's decriminalization of hard drug use, by which is, is meant Schedule One and Schedule Two drugs like methamphetamine or LSD or heroin or oxycodone. Right. And, you know, in Oregon, you know, we have this jurisdictional battle in a lot of states. And at the beginning of, you know, the legalization of marijuana for recreational use, we saw a lot of discussion around what the DEA was going to do. You know, are they going to let these states control their marijuana laws and, and stay out of their business? And more or less, that seems to be what's happened with with other Schedule One and Schedule Two narcotics, I don't like. This is me prognosticating a little bit, and, and I, I just don't know if I see the DEA 
looking the other way like they did on recreational marijuana. Um, how much jurisdictional headbutting do you see coming? Well, you have to keep in mind that the DEA did not usually involve itself in small possession cases anyway. So it's it's not like the state of Oregon is taking away business when it decides that, well, we're only going to have a fine uh, or a civil violation for possessing small amounts of cannabis. That that wasn't, DEA didn't really worry about that. And I I don't imagine that the passage of this law would prevent the DEA from staging major operations against large drug traffickers in the state of Oregon. So in that sense, um, I don't know that there's necessarily a conflict. But in terms of the larger question of marijuana legalization, you're right. It's it's a really strange situation that's been going on for years where the federal government says marijuana is a Schedule One controlled substance. That's what it says in the Controlled Substances Act. And then the states have just split off and gone in a different direction. I thought that the appointment of Jeff Sessions as Attorney General might be a signal that the federal government was going to force the issue because Sessions has a deserved reputation as a drug warrior. But then, of course, um, Sessions ran afoul of Trump for other reasons that were completely unrelated to drug policy. And and so that it's, matters continue to be unresolved. And so these quote-unquote street drugs get a lot of attention for making addicts, and the Oregon law addresses that with classes and treatment um, for people caught with them. Um, but they really are far from history's only culprit in that regard. Um, in the age of addiction, you write about the corporate world's use of addiction as a means to, you know, in, in my words, uh, make money and control customers, but not just with drugs, with, with food, with technology, with with anything that causes a response in the human brain that says, hey, I, I like this, give me more. Um, what led you to write this book, and what can it teach us about today and where we are? Well, I've always been interested in the history of drug use and drug policy. Uh, many moons ago, that's what I wrote my dissertation on. And along the way, I came to realize that drugs were, were actually – part of something else, which in the early uh, 20th century would have been called commercial vice. If, if you go back to, to what I was saying earlier and how uh, progressives in the early 20th century were trying to regulate the drug market or in some cases prohibit some psychoactive substances altogether, these people were not simply interested in what we call drugs let alone street drugs. They were interested in prostitution and gambling and saloons. and It's this whole constellation of commercial vices. And those things didn't go away. Those things didn't go away. In fact, the universe of commercial vices um, has expanded. I mean, if you think about something like uh, pornography or what would have been called obscene literature in the early 20th century, I mean, that that's exponentially expanded with the availability of something like online pornography. So I, uh, in the age of addiction, what I do is is tell the story of how these commercial enterprises, all of which have as their sort of neural common denominator providing intense bursts of brain reward, um, how those industries came into being, how they weathered the reform storm of the late 19th and the early 20th centuries, and how, in fact, in the mid and late 20th century, they triumphed. And uh, they are a huge part of the global economy and um, in many ways have, have transformed everyday life. And what do we kind of take from this? Is there something that the consumer can be more active in its thinking? Is is there a way that they approach, you know, commercial items, whatever they are, um, vices, however may you, you may define them? Yes, I think so. I think this is not just a question of government policy. Uh, that's I, The government does play a role, to be sure, through – 
through regulation and taxation and um, prohibition of certain things that are so intrinsically toxic and dangerous that maybe the, the right approach is to categorize them as a as a Schedule One controlled substance. Um, however, the it's not all on the government, and I think that certainly there's a lot of material available to consumers about the dangers of limbic capitalism, and I think consumers are well aware of the the logic of the limbic capitalist economy, how um, if you can sell a potentially addictive product and you can recruit a large group of heavy daily consumers that are going to provide most of the profits for your enterprise. I think that people understand how this ties into the so-called attention economy and surveillance capitalism, uh, because a lot of... Um, a lot of the limbic capitalist activity has moved online, for example, online gambling. And the, um, there are other ways to make money than people placing bets and, uh, you know, you're, you're collecting the bets that they lose. You can, you can have commercials and all the rest and, that are, and then target them with specific products depending on their, their surfing habits online. You all know how that works, and so I I see a kind of merger. What's happening right now is a is a very disturbing merger of um, the old commercial vice industries resurrected as very technologically sophisticated limbic capitalist enterprises with these these other informational and digitizing trends. Uh, like the attention-based economy, and um, it's, yeah, you need to look out for that. There are a lot of people who have put hooks in the water, and they are looking to hook you. That's right. Now, as we kind of go through these cycles, as I get kind of back more toward um, the, the original story, you know, Oregon is far from the first government to do this, uh, the people of Oregon did it, I should say. Um, in 2001, Portugal legalized the consumption of all drugs. You know, they had had a problem with with addiction, a problem with overdoses, a, a problem with overcrowding of prisons. And, you know, I think that they would say it has been at least a relative success, this policy. Now, Oregon is far from Portugal. The United States is not Europe. Um, but if this Oregon law succeeds and what it's trying to do, and there's no certainty that it will, is this something that could induce other states to have similar laws and eventually the United States to adjust its Schedule One and Schedule Two narcotics? Like you said, you know, we've been doing this with marijuana for so long, but legally speaking, it is still you know, what it is federally. Yeah, the answer is maybe. The um, if, if you step back and you ask a, a broader question, which is, so why is it that we have these cycles of crackdown and then liberalization? And the answer is that the people who decide to crack down on something usually go too far, and that provokes a reaction in the other direction. So that there were there were plenty of people in the early 20th century who thought that it was perfectly acceptable to bar children from saloons, to impose um, uh, age regulations on purchasing something like cigarettes. But when it came to something like the Volstead Act, toward toward prohibiting alcoholic beverages or limiting them only to certain medical or ritual purposes, then they thought, no, that's too far. And then you get uh, kind of push back, uh, saying now we need to repeal prohibition. And you, in each case, in each one of these cycles, you can see that the reformers in the next cycle are reacting against the excesses of the previous cycle. But then the question becomes, what if the reaction goes too far? What if um, Oregon is... Um, an idea that is too extreme in terms of uh, leading to an increase of supply of what are undoubtedly toxic and potentially addictive substances. I mean, historically, increases in supply 
are associated with increases in abuse and addiction and overdose deaths. And if uh, removing penalties makes more people willing to enter the market or it destigmatizes these substances to the point that more people are willing to experiment with them, uh, there will be negative consequences. Now, there will also be benefits. Don't get me wrong. It's, it's likely that each user will um, cause less social harm on average in, in this liberalized environment, but you may end up with a lot more users. So we really don't know. I mean, it, it's to use a simple analogy, it's like you're in a car and somebody's driving 80 miles an hour and you say to the driver, you're driving too fast, you really need to slow down. So the driver slams on the brakes and suddenly the car is going 10 miles an hour and you say, wait a minute, that's too slow, we need to speed up. We really ought to be driving 40 miles an hour or something like that. And and right. unfortunately, in the history of uh, drug policy in the United States, you get these swings between 10 and 80 miles an hour, uh, which are, are often politically motivated. They often have nothing to do with rational drug policy per se, but they have to do with uh, stoking resentments, getting votes, um, culture war posturing, et cetera. And uh, that's why we keep the cycle going. And I, the, the fear that I have is that, that Oregon may be a step too far. I mean, we really don't know if this is, is going to work or not. It's, but if it does, I suppose it will be emulated in other states. Now, is, is this something that you see, you know, obviously – You've mentioned the cyclical nature of it, um, and is this something that, to use just kind of a similar analogy to what you've already used, is this a car going around a track, and we see the same thing over and over again, one than the other, one response, counter response, or is it a pendulum that eventually runs out of energy, and we land at, for, for lack of a better term coming to my mind, a happy medium? That is there a best, I guess, is kind of what I'm looking for. Well, I would just liken it to a car that's going straight down a street or a highway, and it starts off slow, and then it speeds up, and then it slams on the brake. The driver slams on the brakes, and it slows down, and then it starts speeding up again until it's going too fast, and then it slams on the brakes. And, and there's a point in that acceleration where you do have that happy medium, <laughs> so so it's it's not like you're never at the point of having a, a right. kind of Do we stick at forty miles policy. an hour for, for more than a decade ever? Uh in that's an interesting question. It, it, in the in the eyes of many people who have written about the history of drug policy, the nineteen seventies look like the most reasonable decade. The um what happened in the 70s is, in 1970, Congress passed the Controlled Substances Act, which took effect in 1971. And although the uh, CSA, as it's known, later was hardened with amendments passed during the Reagan years, which made it much more punitive, it originally wasn't that punitive. In fact, it actually lowered the penalties on marijuana possession, which is something that, that almost nobody knows in the original version of the law. Um, and it was it provided more flexible sentencing provisions. It applied some additional money for public health approaches to addiction. In other words, there were there were liberal aspects of the legislation, but there were also uh, law enforcement aspects, such as the provision of additional money for additional uh, DEA agents. And the um, another important aspect of that law is that it basically said, look, there are a lot of people out there who are taking, quote-unquote, legal drugs, um, sedatives, tranquilizers like Valium, and getting into trouble with it, and we need to regulate those substances too. So it, it created a, a more rational framework of control where it wasn't all just about heroin and pot and LSD, but in fact it was it was about creating a rational and regulated system of drug control for all of the proliferating psychoactive substances that were out there. 
And you'd be surprised that there there are commentators whose views are all over the political spectrum who look back with a certain amount of nostalgia on on the uh, especially on the early 70s because even though Nixon is usually credited with the um, you know or he's the one who originated the modern drug war it goes back to the early 70s well Nixon also put a lot of money into treatment and into methadone maintenance and other policies that are not associated with a hard line, at least historically not associated with a hard line on drug policy. So so there so that would be, I think, the early seventies would be a classic example of a period where the the car was was going at the right speed. But, you know, drug policy again is not simply driven by what's the best policy, what's the utilitarian solution to the public health problem versus the individual freedom problem. It's driven by political considerations. And so, for example, by the late 1970s, you have parents groups organizing. uh, They're alarmed by the rapid increase in youthful marijuana consumption. They want something done about it. They want marijuana re-stigmatized. They ultimately find their leader in Nancy Reagan and the Just Say No campaign of the early 80s, and that ultimately, after the the emergence of crack cocaine, that congeals into a a much a much more hardline drug war by say 86 through 91. So the car speeds up again, and so on and so on forever, right? Well, no, I, I mean, I'm not uh, – to say, you know, you have to be careful here. Uh, Maybe. As an, well, as an historian, you can look at 100 or 150 years of American drug use and drug policy and say, what I see is a cycle. And the, it, it's, a, it's a cycle which has this unique dynamic of once the reformers in a particular cycle go too far – other people push back, and then they go too far, and so on and on. But but to describe a period of time as accurately, as, as, as being characterized by that dynamic, is not necessarily to say that's the future, that we're just condemned to, to be on this roller coaster of drug policy forever. Um, so I'm not I'm not a complete pessimist in, in that regard. Although I again to go back to the point that you raised earlier, I don't think it's about drugs anymore. I I think uh, to give you the example of sugar, there are many many people who regard sugar as a kind of incipient drug. Uh, so does it has uh, well you know, and so you've got uh, what might be called a neo progressive reform movement of people who are looking to do things like um, uh, tax sugary beverages, which is, you know, Bloomberg got his, his fingers wrapped for that when he tried it, but, you know, that's caught on in a lot of states, and also it's been endorsed by the World Health Organization. A number of countries, uh, Mexico included, have gone down the tax road, and they uh, believe very strongly that heavy consumption of sugar poses a threat to public health. They're quite right to believe that in terms of diseases like diabetes. And so you, it, it may be the, the other possibility here is that, yes, the cycle will continue, but now it's going to continue with respect to a whole, you know, a whole array of substances and behaviors that weren't you know, narrowly considered drug policy, or, or uh, say earlier in in, in the uh, in the last century. All right, Dr. Courtright, thanks so much for being with me. Um, I I feel like I am much better educated on this topic. Um, appreciate you coming on. Well, thank you for having me, Daniel. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks to everyone at home for joining us. I hope today's conversation was as enlightening for you as it was for me. If you're enjoying this series and would like to contribute to its cause, please share this episode on social media. And if you are particularly inclined, you can financially support the podcast at anchor.fm 
slash RTWI history slash support. That's anchor.fm slash RTWI history slash support. Please come back next week when we will be discussing more of the history we live through every day.